As 2024 comes to a close, I think I want to call this portion of the hype cycle the small but mighty era of open source LLMs. We've been seeing a number of much smaller models or adaptations of larger models come out and do pretty incredible things. And I will say performance does vary, but I want to talk about a really interesting foray we got last week, which was Yeecoder being fully open sourced and offered in two really curious sizes with a very curiously large context length. And what's cool is to see kind of a more general purpose model now fine-tuned to focus on coding and being built for tools like Ader, which are being actively developed and I think are some of the more interesting tools even outside of things like Cursor today. Local models that don't actually have to reach out to APIs to do inference and give you pretty usable code, I think are quickly going to become some of the most powerful and most widely deployed models. Sure, you can use something like Cloud Sonnet or ChatGPT for lots of generalized tasks, but but if my background in iOS app development has taught me anything, finding specific problems that aren't quite executed as well as you'd like is the key to riches in most cases. And we're starting to see this happen with small LLMs, which is what I wanna get into in this breakdown of Yeecoder and why it's such a big deal. So welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So first off, I wanna start out by saying that Yeecoder was not necessarily the most impressive coding model I've worked with, even at its small size of 1.5 billion parameters, which is pretty cool. I tried this with chat and base, even did some fine tuning, and frankly, I was a little underwhelmed. I know a lot of people who review these AI models will just look at benchmarks and say, oh, they're saying it's the best, or oh, they're saying that this is the best thing I've ever used, and seem to only give positive feedback. And unfortunately, this is one video where I'm going to push back a little bit on some of the claims made by O1 AI. As cool as it is that they open source this model and have made a lot of their process open as well. So the high level breakdown of this model is they released this in two sizes, in 9 billion and 1.5 billion parameters. Both have a 128,000 token context length and in theory there are 52 programming languages supported. And what's most interesting to me is what these were trained on. So these were in theory trained on a number of data sets, both from GitHub and on raw code. What I think is interesting is this model does a great job of giving you kind of an overview of process and architecture, and I would say a less good job of just telling you what code you should use or that functions right after a single prompt. And I think the best source of information to do a breakdown here is the release blog post. And one thing that I like about O1 AI is although they're a Chinese AI lab, they understand how to communicate their LLMs quite well in English and clearly are academic in nature, but understand where to go deep and where to kind of stay general in terms of describing their work, which basically makes it really fun to read and you get all the information you want pretty much right up front. So again, they've released these as 1.5 and 9 billion parameter models. And the whole idea behind eCoder, at least stated here, is a series of open source code large language models that deliver state-of-the-art coding performance with fewer than 10 billion parameters. So that was kind of their goal. They've released these as both base and chat versions, which is pretty cool. And what's also interesting is they mentioned efficient inference and flexible training. And efficient inference is something that's come up in a number of my previous videos. And it's curious to see this really coming out as a serious trend. Initially, it was something that I just thought was kind of a fad. You'll see these show up on Hugging Face where people want to use keywords in papers just to get more uh, eyes on their papers in the hopes of getting them published. But it's pretty cool. So where did Yeecoder 9B actually come from? The bigger of these two models. So Yeecoder 9B actually builds upon Ye 9B with an additional 2.4 trillion high quality tokens meticulously sourced from repository level code corpuses on GitHub. So basically this means GitHub repos that had really good histories and really good kind of provenance of what led to their current state with test passing, etc. They also used a lot of code related data filtered from Common Crawl. Common Crawl is a really interesting project you should check out. It's a little controversial in terms of like what they do with the data, but this is a really great example of basically getting a lot of human filtered data, feeding it into a model that's quite small and then leveraging it really well. And this is a cool thing that um, small models can present. When I was mentioning my iOS stuff, I knew people who just spent tons of time looking at apps that were really popular that maybe just weren't executed quite as well. And I think we're seeing a really interesting trend with this in open source LLMs and then applications built from them. Because obviously I myself probably can't go and produce anything like Llama 3, 4, or 5B. There's just too much data involved and too much compute involved. But something like this, that's just meant to be a coding model, albeit a very small coding model at under 10 billion parameters, uh, like Yeecoder, in theory, you know, a pretty small team could get together 
If we're all developers, we all basically know what high quality code is and tooling is good enough now that seemingly we could take that data and create something really powerful, which I believe is what's happened here with eCoder 1.5b. So the key feature is, as they describe it here, um, is that it's been pre-trained on, again, 2.4 trillion high quality tokens for 52 major languages. I found that was probably maybe not entirely true, but it was still impressive. The long context modeling is also a big one, and this depends on your project. And I think if you're working with JavaScript, there are times where you probably won't be able to fit all of your dependencies into this. But uh, they claim that this is a big enough context window to, to enable project level code comprehension and generation. Uh, comprehension and generation being very different things, but both uh, equally important. They also later in this blog mentioned cross file dependencies. So basically uh, similarities between different files that reference each other, which is basically comprehension. And then generation is saying, you know, you understand these. So now generate something that keeps both of these in mind. I think 128,000 tokens is good enough for like simple projects, but to say you could just dump an entire TypeScript project into here is probably not super accurate. And the claim they make here, which they then back up with some benchmarks is that eCoder 9b outperforms other models again with under 10 billion parameters such as CodeQuen 1.57b, CodeGeek 49b, and they claim that they achieve performance on par with DeepSeek Coder 33b, which frankly I disagree with, but it definitely gets close and it's better in other areas, uh, specifically architecting, which is a problem that most people don't believe has actually been solved by LLMs yet. The idea being that sure, you can generate all this code, but if you don't know where to put it and how to maintain it, you're not really getting a productivity gain in the long term. Now, another thing that I found really interesting is this thing called Live Code Bench. Now, what this is, is an approach to benchmarking coding models where they're using specific questions from Leet Code, Ad Code, or Code Forces, all these different tools that are used for to make programming interviews um, even more mind numbing. And of course, in theory, there are cutoffs and beginnings to these question sets and there are new questions that are added. But the thing is, is there, all these questions are pretty similar. So I kind of question whether or not this is really still a great measure of these models and whether or not they're just regurgitating answers. But they claim that eCoder's training date cutoff was at the end of 2023 and they only selected problems from January to September of 2024 for testing. Now, of course, some of these problems build on other ones, but it's interesting to see their comparative performance. And the highlights here are as follows. So Yeecoder 9B achieved a 23.4% pass rate, making it the only model under 10 billion parameters to exceed 20%, which is pretty cool. And I think this is where they're mostly pulling that uh, nearly achieves the performance of Deep Sea Coder 33B, which is quite cool. Obviously this kind of varies depending on where you're looking at it. And um, it was probably cherry picked a little bit because this model was really only given coding data and there is a good chance that one of those GitHub repos was probably just someone like putting all of their lead code solutions into it with changes, which doesn't mean that they cheated. It just means this model is probably better at um, giving you lead code solutions. So if you need a little bit of a bump in an interview in the, a market like today, uh, maybe try using this with Aider and uh, you might have some pretty good outcomes. Later on, they mentioned human eval, MBPP, and crux eval O, which I was actually not previously aware of crux eval O, but what's interesting is this model still holds up relatively well. Obviously, there are other models that are probably overfitting to some of these benchmarks, but they still perform within punching distance of Yeecoder 9B. 1.5B is kind of a different story. It's not as impressive, but it's still impressive given its small size, especially when you look at something like CodeQuen only scoring 7 to 8% better than a 1.5 billion parameter model, which a few months ago or earlier this summer was something that we thought might just not happen. There's also a really cool bench called Code Editor Bench, which I think is quite interesting. And I was also not aware of this. So this is basically um, using open source code LLMs to move files around and basically understand what is wrong in a given project. So this is what they meant by project scale. And I, it would be cool to see like the Git changes uh, in what these models are actually manipulating. But in a, at a cursory glance, doing well in this benchmark is legitimately impressive to me as a software engineer. And for those of you who don't know, I've been shilling Ader a lot on this channel, um, but it is my favorite kind of coding uh, utility for now. I'm really not a fan of cursor to be frank. And what's cool is they actually have a, an LLM leaderboard for um, coding benchmarks. It's basically just looking at Python source files across a little over a hundred coding exercises from this kind of online course. And what's cool is it doesn't only test a model's capacity to generate new code, but also proficiency in integrating new code into an existing code base, which is pretty hard. And frankly, this is something that ChatGPT couldn't really do until early this summer. 
Now, obviously bigger models are going to do better here, but seeing Yeecoder 9B chat do basically as well as Codestrel 2405 and Quen 272B Instruct from earlier this year is pretty awesome. And it's maybe a new direction that we'll see a lot of these coding models take in terms of making them as powerful as possible. Cross-code eval is pretty similar. This is where I mentioned that it's also looking at these cross-file dependencies, which previously was something that even with large uh, context windows and even forms of RAG would really trip these models up. And again, Ecoder 9B is doing incredibly well here. So there's something that really to be said about the code manipulation and, co and sort of uh, coherence ability of this model going forward, which I think is pretty cool. And it worked in Java, so it can do object-oriented languages like Python, which in theory can be written in both formats. And I think it's pretty cool. It's also great at needle in the code benchmarks, which is kind of a cool thing to see now just be very common. So it can actually utilize this context window quite aggressively, which is cool to see. This is not just some kind of random claim. And then of course, a lot of really good coding models do come from a basis in mathematical reasoning, just in terms of understanding sequence and basic kind of problem solving strategies. And it's no surprise that Yeecoder 9B does really well here. So I was pretty impressed. However, when I started to mess around with this model a bit, my excitement kind of waned and I'll show you why. So if you check out their Hugging Face page, which I'll link below, they offer four different versions, just basically chat and base of 1.5b and 9b versions of Yeecoder. And I have to say that when I use this both locally and within the Hugging Face uh, test here, I was curious that their chat version was actually just as kind of a communication based as their base model. This is actually the first coding model I actually had to find uh, and tweak the system prompt to actually get it to give me code and not just like describe files or dependencies to get me started in a project. So I'd be really interested to look at what kind of code they actually train this on, basically whether or not they were looking at a lot of tutorial projects or a lot of more existing larger projects, you know, like Redis or things that weren't necessarily tools or, you know, someone building a website, but were like big projects that represent platforms or frameworks, which to an LLM without enough context, you know, could be kind of confusing. So frankly, I was not super impressed. I'm going to try fine tuning a little bit more and working in some languages that maybe are more common, like Python or Go. Um, TypeScript sometimes trips these models up. Is that I don't necessarily entirely understand. Probably because, you know, JavaScript is in so many things now and understanding kind of a flavor of JavaScript might be something that these models struggle with. But I definitely recommend you check these models out. Their local demo is quite cool. Uh, although this is one thing where you can tell that they didn't communicate like how to run it very well. Um, I figured it out, but it's really truly meant to be run uh, on your device, which is kind of interesting. And they had pictures of this great interface. And then I realized that there was basically no way to run it unless you just clone their repo and, um, run right away, which I did not have time to get video of. But let me know what you think. I think uh, this whole trend of small models is really cool. I was not really that impressed with all of the Apple stuff released yesterday. You know, I think it's cool, but I mean, the funny thing is the biggest thing they bragged about was breaking people's privacy and then a diffuser's model that can run on an iPhone 16 that can create custom emojis, which was something that happened in open source AI more than a year ago. So let me know what you think about the Apple release. Let me know what you think about small coding models from Yi. The fact that they open source this is awesome and I'm always glad to see open source models, but I think there's probably still a little bit left to be desired in terms of its real usability outside of just benchmarking well and admittedly it's incredible performance with working with you know project scale dependencies and working out from there. So as always, I hope you learned something in this video. If you like our content, please like, subscribe, and share, and we'll see you in the next one.